Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today we will discuss uh, um, a, a big collaboration called Toward Trustworthy AI Development Mechanisms for Supporting Verifiable Claims. So it's, um, um, it's a collaboration led by Miles Brundage, Shahar Avin, Jasmine Wong, Hayden Bedfield, and Gretchen Kruger, uh, with um, a couple of uh, other uh, researchers from OpenAI, Montreal, McGill, uh, EPFL, École Normale Supérieure, and Google Brain, etc. And um, so um, uh, we will follow the structure of the paper more or less in this discussion, where we first will discuss the institutional mechanisms uh, for trustworthy um, for trustworthy AI uh, development. Then we'll move to software mechanisms, and finally hardware mechanisms and specifications. Um, who wants to start? Maybe Le or Louis on uh, yes. institutional mechanism. Yes, the the well, the one of the, the important problems is of course uh, how to uh, verify and uh, audit uh, people who are designing uh, uh, AIs, and how to make sure that these AIs are are constructed with the right uh, um, uh, interpretability, privacy, uh, uh, no bias uh, conditions, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, in order to do this, uh, the first section of the paper uh, focuses on institutional mechanisms and uh, what kinds of uh, structures should be put in place. And the, 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 the first bullet point, and which is, um, is the, the third party auditing problem. Uh, so this is what happens in, in the banking industry. Uh, you have this uh, uh, auditing made by uh, outside uh, companies that can be uh, governmental and maybe for for ai uh even probably surely we need some uh, external auditing of uh of some sort uh, to to understand uh to better track what if, if the algorithms are well designed and uh yeah if they, they verify uh, the the specific conditions we want them to, to verify um yeah, I don't know if you have more comments on this. Uh, well, the problem is that, uh, of course, uh, as we already discussed, this raises a lot of different different problems um, in practice. Uh, like, uh, well, I guess there's uh, some legal problem. Like, uh, this probably need to be legalized uh, uh, for this to be done uh, uh, consistently. Uh, it's hard to think of other mechanisms through which this can be uh, implemented uh, uh, yeah, for, for, for actual companies uh, these days. Uh, another problem is um, like th there's going to be a need of a collaboration of the other company uh, to to produce uh, uh, yeah to 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 uh, make available what it is that needs to be audited. Uh, actually, there's even the question of what it is that we're auditing. Do we audit uh, the data? Do we audit the the learning algorithms? Do we edit? Uh, do do we audit uh, the the uh, uh, the algorithms that ha ha have learned uh, the each of the objective function of the algorithm, uh, which is still uh, another thing and uh, like arguably the most important, I would say. But yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so far, uh, I don't think it would be very easy at all. <laughs> I think it would be a huge enterprise, uh, even for uh, perhaps especially for big companies like Google. Uh, yeah, they probably have very intertwined code and uh, not ready to be like uh, audited. Uh, so, but but this could be also like interesting like to to make to to push them in this direction because uh, it would maybe force them to have. A more structured code. Well, I don't know about that code. Maybe it's already very well structured. But like, if you're trying to make transparent to you have a, a an, an additional incentive to to make your code uh, documented and, and clean. Um, so yeah, I think everybody agrees that uh, there needs to be some some sort of better auditing like this. Uh, to which extent and how? Uh, what well, the devil's in the details, I guess. Yep. Uh, something to add about uh, third-party auditing. Otherwise, we can explain the next one. So yes, go ahead. Auditing the auditors. That's in the fifth point. <laughs> that's what we discussed at the end. I think. Uh, the second uh, 
the second uh, recommendation uh, of program to work on at the level of institutions uh, is uh, recommending uh, more red team exercises. So red team exercises consist in uh, trying to uh, at attack the, the system that you are designing yourself uh, to, to, to test for failures, to test for, uh, for lack of uh, robustness resilience. And uh, so the, the author recommend that uh, developers of AI would uh, learn better skills to, uh, to perform these kind of exercises and uh, to be able to, to catch before, be, before it happens the, the possible problem that would arise with their, with their software. Um, one thing we can think of is, for example, last time we discussed about uh, DP3T and uh, the, the author is writing uh, the, the, fr the framework of DP3T. They, they really made uh, the extra effort to think of how uh, different agents could uh, different stakeholders uh, could uh, try to attack and uh, and break the the system and this is extremely important to to ask these kind of questions because otherwise the you could end up in a in a case where your system doesn't work and you did not anticipate uh, how how it would go so and uh, the author find that this uh, sort of skill like a uh, threat uh, threat modeling is uh, is uh, lacking Within uh, AI developers, and uh, and should be uh, should be more motivated. And uh, this is also something we can recommend to to AI developers not doing only research but working in uh, large companies. And uh, one thing we a second example that we often talk about is uh, simply the effect of uh, maximizing engagement, which uh, led to uh, a lot of biases and polarization on uh, on social medias. Mm -hmm. This is also a kind of flow that uh, AI developers should uh, try to see how people will react to their system and 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 uh, and anticipate the, the worst cases that could, could happen. So yeah, I, I don't know how, how, how much we can stay on this point, but um, I wanted to comment a bit on the interpretability part of the. So so the the, the report has the usual calls for interpretable, transparent um, uh, algorithms. Uh, I know that Le has a lot of caveats to add to interpretability. Well, yeah, it's just that uh, it's uh, ill-defined. And uh, so as I like to say, interpretability uh, requires interpretation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, like, like a sense in which uh, the algorithms could be uh, transparent is if its code is open, but it, it, or if it's a neural network, its code is like the weight of the different uh, uh, synapses. And, and actually, you won't learn, well, you will learn a few things uh, by having this data, but it's not it's explaining a lot of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's actually research to be done about uh, what kind of interpretations of the, of the algorithms can be done. I think it's also very tied with the, uh, uh, human psychology, like uh, what it is that we find uh, will increase trustworthiness in the algorithm in terms of data and interpretation. The, the, yeah. the, the, the risk with interpretability, so um, calls for interpretability are um, are fair. Uh, and and I, th I think we, we should always have some level of interpretability. Uh, there's also evidence, research evidence, that adding ev um, interpretability constraints improves, um, actually improves the algorithm. You can yeah. see it as a sort of regularization. So if you if you constrain the, the algorithm to be, in addition to, to be accurate, to be interpretable, so naturally you would force the training to select less complex models and regularize somehow by interpretability. You can see it as some sort of sophisticated Occam's razor. Uh, so it has benefits. There, like there is empirical evidence for uh, for the benefits of having interpretability constraints besides interpretability itself. Now, the the caveat is that um, uh, if uh, so, the, the, there are risks of making up a story or, or 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 of cherry picking one explanation of the algorithm when you when you start having interpretable or trying to make it interpretable. So if you take, say, the, like, if you take a neural network, 
as, as an algorithm. So, so obviously, th this is the algorithm you deploy. You deploy so so people most of, like many times people reviewers especially they, they they don't think of neural networks as algorithms. Like they talk about the model, the model, the weights, uh, the parameter vector, but they they forget and or sometimes it 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 happens to us that. We tend to forget that at the end of the day, this parameter vector will be deployed itself as an algorithm. So we think of, let's say, the training algorithm as the algorithm, so SGD, a gradient descent, as the algorithm. So that's the algorithm we use to train the model or the parameter vector. But once we are done training, uh, we deploy something called the parameter vector or the model, and we, we tend to think of it as a model or like a set of parameters and not as, as an algorithm. It is actually, it is an algorithm, you will execute it. So it tells you by how much you multiply this and by how much you multiply this and how much you add this with this. And at the end, this is how you decide that, that the, the photo contains a, a, um, a prisoner or someone who is not likely to be a prisoner. So you can, you know, take a, an obscure example from uh, for ju judicial deployments and if you sometimes if you if you start cherry picking explanation you say oh it predicts that this person is likely to be a prisoner because it wears this thing that has been observed in all the groups of this band this criminal band or it has this tattoo the person has she or he has this tattoo and we know that the tattoo is present in all the members of this criminal group fine but you might start cherry picking like imagine a, lo a lot of pathways in a neural network you might start cherry picking pathways to make up yeah. an explanation yeah so it's uh, uh like i think we should think of these algorithms uh, especially like large neural networks as uh, as complex systems mm -hmm. And uh, when you're analyzing a complex system, especially if you have motivated reasoning, uh, there's a risk of, uh, of oh yeah, say, can do it. Maybe I can more I can comment more on that because I so that I I, I mentioned the word pathway and uh, so th this kind of objects, a graph with a lot of nodes and a lot of paths. So you can see a neural network as a graph, and then you have a lot of neurons and then paths. So you have features, this is the mustache feature, the trouser feature, etc. And then you have pathways between them and the output. We have the same thing in biology in, in um, metabolic networks. So you have a lot of a graph of reactions between metabolites. You have this gene and this piece of RNA yeah. is a catalyzer uh, for this protein. And this protein is so, so it expresses this protein and this protein is in turn catalyzer of this reaction. And um, for for the early days, in the early days of of, um, of um, bioinformatics, once we started sequencing the genome, you had a lot of speculative uh, interpretation where people would start talking about, oh, this is the gene of, uh, to, to cite a recent controversy, this is the gene of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. We now know that there's not such a thing as a gene of, or like this is the gene of this trait. And now we, we know that um, it's not about this piece or that piece or this pathway. It's like it's way more complex. And if you start so if you start analyzing a complex system, a complex graph like this, you, you the pro probability that you are just cherry picking something is close to one. Yeah. So you shouldn't absolutely try to explain a complex system by just like taking a small pathway and say, okay, look, there's this tattoo, and because the trouser is blue, then therefore this is the prisoner. Yeah. Yeah, it's a even a more general question about epistemology or what, what it is that we mean when we mean uh, an explanation. And uh, it's a complicated question. I think philosophers debate this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, interpretability really needs interpretation and it's a, a hopefully better interpretation rather than <laughs> worse interpretation. Another point I want to, to mention about interpretability is that uh, uh, there's the question of interpretable uh, to whom, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, some explanations are perfectly valid for computer scientists. So if you tell me that uh, 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 university assignment uh, system where, where students are assigned to, to different universities, if it uh, follows the gauge chaplet algorithm, that, that's fine for me, I can understand. Mm -hmm. But if you tell that to uh, the general public or just non-computer scientists in general, uh, yeah, it's no longer clear that it's that interpretable, even though it's not a very complicated algorithm. And when you're talking about DP3T or like these algorithms that are 
slightly more complicated than the, than uh, than um, uh, the gauge apply algorithm. Yeah, yeah the, the question of interpretable to whom is really becomes a big problem. Like you can spend hours and hours explaining uh, uh, the algorithm. Maybe you actually need hours and hours to explain the algorithm to the layman, but you also have to have his attention for hours and hours, and uh, usually you don't. So in the end, these algorithms are somewhat opaque to, to, to people who don't spend enough time thinking about them. Yeah, the, the author of, of the paper mentioned uh, some research done with uh, uh, data scientists or computer scientists where uh, explanations were generated and they were asked to uh, to actually interpret the, the explanation to somehow uh, these uh, social studies to to explain uh, to 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 better understand what are good uh, uh, interpretability methods, but uh, overall they they recommend uh, more work on uh, more research work on uh, interpretability too, because as of today there is no uh, frame or clear uh, clear definition of what interpretability uh, means. Uh, yeah. Do you you too do you think it's uh, it's an uh, important work for AI safety uh, landscape. So, so in a sense, this is uh, kind of the job of science communication, like just explaining. Okay, explanation is also the job of <laughs> of science communicators, and uh, well, I, I I spend a lot of time trying to do this, and it's just very very hard. And the more complex things are, uh, if you have to very complex algorithms, well, if I struggle to understand it, <laughs> I will have an even harder time to to explain it and uh, yeah it's just very 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 hard <laughs> and there's no simple path like there's no uh, clear guide guideline about like this is how you should uh, explain this concept in science no it's it's uh, there are you often when concepts are complicated there are multiple ways to go you actually need multiple ways to go and in the end uh, even if you take the best uh, science proposal out there uh, it's still possible that they will convey more misinformation than actual information, even though everything they're saying is right, because uh, well, it's very hard. Like people mis misinterpret things, and uh, it's hard. Like just like very, very simple stuff, like uh, uh, the uh, Newton's uh, law uh, f equals m a. Even this is very hard to get through. To, to really have this inner feeling that yeah, it's acceleration that's affected by forces, not speed or velocity. Even this is very hard to communicate. So, mm -hmm. yeah, try to explain uh, uh, neural networks and how it can go wrong, and uh, it, it gets very complicated. All right. Uh, this was actually one of the points uh, they make in the in the second section, which is uh, discussing uh, software mechanisms to uh, to improve uh, trustworthiness in uh, in uh, algorithms in general. So. Yeah. To go back on the on the first uh, point, which were uh, institutional mechanisms, two other ideas that we uh, that we did not uh, mention yet is uh, uh, the first one: uh, giving bounties for finding uh, bias and uh, safety issues in uh, in algorithms. Uh -huh. This is something that is uh, already uh, down done a lot for for usual uh, uh, programming uh, bugs in uh, in software. And uh, but it's it, it's not done for an algorithm that start to recommend a very uh, problematic content or or other machine learning algorithms. The, this thing is not is not well spread yet, and we hope that the the authors hope that uh, by putting in place some some sort of bounties, it will motivate uh, uh, the general public that is uh, knowledgeable on uh, machine learning to. To look for these bugs and report them. So, one thing we can think of today is that if you, if someone find a bug on a on the YouTube recommender system, there is there is no uh, no reward into simply uh, revealing this bug. But uh, what someone of today could do is uh, simply use this to to generate ad revenue instead of uh, of uh, telling it to Google and uh, and helping to fix it. So that's why these kind of uh, bounties can be useful. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as the software gets more and more complicated, the testing of the software gets usually overwhelmingly more mm -hmm. costly than the 
production or the development, the initial development of the, the software. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, there, there needs to be uh, a lot of testing, like <laughs> huge uh, incentives, financial incentives, uh, social incentives as well. This works a lot uh, in the open source community uh, to, to find bugs and correct bugs. And uh, yeah, this is an important task. Uh, and this is all the more important for for machine learning algorithms uh, that can have uh, that have been shown to have ex a lot of uh, hidden uh, vulnerabilities. Well, Mehdi knows a lot about this. <laughs> it is basically. Oh, yeah, I was, I was saying in the discussion that um, I find more reasons to have both bounty programs in machine learning than in traditional software. Because um, so um, traditional for, for, for traditional software. Uh, there is basically a piece of code that is way more interpretable because it was written by hand or by many hands. So you could imagine a setting where many hands will review that code and audit it. And sometimes for the client, it's uh, safer to do this auditing internally and not leave it in the public domain for bug bounty. So of course, in bug bounty programs, you don't share the code necessarily. But, uh, for example, you can do something like penetration testing. So I don't share the code, but I can invite you to try penetrate my website. And then if you find a uh, vulnerability that allows you to penetrate the website, then you can win that bounty, and especially if you can explain why and help me fix the, the vulnerability. So there are reasons. Um, so in, in case of websites, obviously the website is already there. So there is incentives to have the bounty programs on, for example, penetration testing. This is main, main part. So uh, uh, according to a friend who is a penetration tester, uh, for, for a company that deals with banks, like this is one of the largest markets they, they have is, is just penetration testing of, of online bank banking websites. And then the, 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 the thing is already there. It's already public, it's already there. You can, you can make it uh, into a bounty bounty program. For most of traditional software, you don't want to expose it to external reviewing. So there are incentives for for clients not to go for bug bug bounty programs and keep it keep all this in internal. Now uh, for uh, machine learning, there is uh, one thing that makes uh, that uh, that is very different from digital software is that you have the software, so say the weights of the neural network, uh, and then uh, you don't want you don't know how it behaves on every data point. You you only you only test it on you you. Are limited by how much data you have. So if someone out, outside in the outside world has some set of data set or a distribution of data that you would never have accessed, then you would be happy to audit your, your software with their data set. So for example, they can they maybe imagine like you, you trained your uh, you trained your neural network on, on data uh, only coming from um, American citizens. And then uh, someone has a data set of people living in India and, uh, or, 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 or in Japan. Uh, and they can, they, can, they can test it on your, on your software and say, OK, look, you have a bias against this or this feature that is not very present in the American uh, data set. Uh, so th this, is, this, is, this is something where, where, where you can see beneficial, beneficial outsourcing of auditing. And, uh, especially like, for example, auditing for bias, uh, auditing for bias, or even for inaccuracies um, uh, that, that people do not necessarily call bias. Uh, so you just for like, for, for even for like robustness and, and, and accuracy of the algorithm, you can, you can see a lot of reasons to, to adopt bug bounty programs for, for machine learning. But yeah, in, and in terms of vulnerability, as you said, uh, and in general, like there are like several other reasons why, why machine learning should probably embrace bug bounty spirit, is that the space of vulnerability is extremely high. We deal with yeah. very high dimensional uh, spaces of data and of models, and you can just you can just do it the the, the old way of like you just audit things and start reviewing them, etc. So maybe like crowdsourcing the audits. And, with bug bounty programs could be could be a uh, could be could be efficient. Uh, a thing related to this is uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, machine learning, especially neural networks, or anything that's uh, gradient based, so it's not very uh, necessarily uh, neural networks, but anything anything that's gradient based, uh, 
is more vulnerable if the attacker knows the code, uh, the weights in particular, because then he can compute the gradient and, and uh, he can have these uh, so-called uh, evasion attacks. So like, transparency opens uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and so th there's, yeah, there's a, uh, it's not clear like what should be really transparent and what should not be transparent for safety reasons. Like, I'm just thinking about in terms of safety here. So uh, yeah, this should be also, uh, I guess, something to be, uh, yeah, but better understood and see what is the optimal uh, trade-off here between transparency, oh, like security. Like I think the, the overall goal here, at least if it's uh, security, security and, uh, and trustworthiness, uh, like it, it's not clear that a transparent uh, 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 differentiable model should be uh, made uh, transparent. Yeah, we discussed this topic uh, in uh, the first episode of the podcast. Uh, yeah discussing uh, accountability of uh, black boxes. Yeah, uh, another thing we did not discuss earlier is the, the uh, having the like the data uh, or the logs of what has been done by the algorithm can, can still be extremely worthwhile, uh, especially if you think in terms of the, the YouTube recommender system uh, and understanding what is recommended, for instance, by the platform right now is impossible for outsiders, but it's very hard for outsiders. Like you need to do some a lot of tricks like uh, Guillaume Chaslow or, or Joachim Algeier. Uh, yeah, it's not easy. And so uh, if there were more like collaboration between YouTube and, uh, and research entities, and uh, because there's also this GDPR uh, problem because the data, uh, uh, it's very hard to make them both useful and, uh, and uh, differentially, like really uh, private, uh, like the, yeah, we talked about the example of Netflix, um, of the Netflix prize, uh, where uh, Netflix gave data, uh, made public some, some data and they anonymized it, but like it was uh, de-anonymized afterwards because you could relate this to, uh, uh, to co you could connect this with what people uh, commented on some other website uh, like uh, IMDB. Uh, and so just this thought about how to better understand what is done by the YouTube recommender and how to allow only researchers, for instance, uh, and not the general public uh, to export this data to better understand and better audit and better and improve the, the algorithm if something is really bad. Uh, yeah, this should be thought carefully. It's not easy, but this is, sounds like something quite desirable. Uh, as opposed to uh, like today, some researchers, what they do is what well, they try to find some API. It's much harder like, to get these day, relevant data, for instance, to to, to understand uh, the radicalization paths on, on YouTube, as has been done by uh, one of our colleagues at DBFL. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, move... What you mentioned Lee, is one of the mm -hmm. uh, recommendations about software mechanism, uh, leaving audit trails. This is the, yeah. the term they use. Uh, so f f one thing they recommend is also to uh, to, to, to do research on uh, what kind of logs would actually be uh, more meaningful. So, uh, mm -hmm. I guess there is uh, many ways that algorithms can, uh, can keep track of uh, what it is doing and if there are some that, that are more meaningful for, for auditing uh, later on. Mm -hmm. One reason it's, uh, it's really related to trust is, is uh, this comparison they do with uh, how airplanes uh, are working. Uh, in an airplane, there is a, a flight recorder that is keeping track of everything that is happening in, in the airplane, of the many metrics. And this, uh, these are uh, a part of, uh, of, of why we, we really trust planes. And uh, thanks to these uh, flight recorders, for the few accidents that plane have had, uh, we could know, we could get back to the, to the source of the accident and fix them. I think a plane would be a lot less trustworthy if, 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 when, there was, if when there were accidents, we could just say we don't know what happened and and stop stop yeah. there. This would be a very terrible system. Yeah, but these logs definitely exist in <laughs> in YouTube uh, or Facebook. Yeah. 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 Maybe part of uh, of these logs would also be to uh, because the log of uh, YouTube and Facebook are, are definitely absolutely huge. Maybe some uh, uh, I think for the planes they they measure some other kind of metrics. 
and uh, I, I think I think we could come up with some metrics that make the the log more easily understandable. So, for example, uh, YouTube could log every video that is recommending, but it could also log the 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 ways with which it takes decision over time. Uh, for example, if it has a uh, vectorized par uh, par parameterization of uh, of every video, and we know that these parameters depend on a, on some dimensions yeah. like uh, what topic the video is, uh, how long the video is, etc. Logging this kind of metric could be m m better to simply audit the algorithms and simply uh, logs of uh, what the algorithm did. Okay, okay. Should we move to hardware? Or do yeah. you want to still discuss something? Okay, let's go for hardware. So one of the points the, they they raise in the article, which is very uh, a natural comment to, to, to raise, is that um, you, you have to make sure that your hardware, hardware is secure in the sense that it is running what is what it is supposed to run and only what it is supposed to run. We, we briefly mentioned that in a previous episode where we mentioned maybe something they, 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 that is not present in this report, which is the, the very low level of vulnerabilities you can have in the CPU and, uh, and uh, uh, but, but, but again, like when discussing the, the paper of trustworthy AI, we more or less all agreed that the threat model for, for machine, most machine learning, like there's so much threat on the, on the high level uh, software part that's that this is probably not one of the top priority in terms of risk for now i don't know what's your recall yeah. of the discussion on that and this is also the this was the topic of your phd that even though one third or 20 percent of the hardware that you were using got hacked and start behaving in a different way uh, uh, still be resi uh, implementing systems that are still robust and resilient to this kind of uh, situation yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think we can think of different attacks on uh, on on, uh, on hardware. Uh, like the worst kind of attack would be a backdoor uh, installed by the designer, uh, as we discussed. But yeah, this is a uh, yeah, this is very hard to defend against. And uh, yeah. as you say, maybe there are other priorities for, for uh, a field for a field that is still struggling with the average and the median. I think yeah. uh, this is not yet. <laughs> Yeah. Is it not yet the most uh, the most likely re cause for vulnerability? We we still have way more obvious vulnerabilities in machine learning. Yeah, but yeah, and then there are other attacks. Maybe somehow some some part of the hardware can be hacked, and well, this, even this uh, is not the most uh, likely threat model, let's say. But uh, one that's much more reasonable is that part of it uh, crash. Uh, and this happens uh, probably all the time, and uh, especially if you have bigger and bigger systems. But yeah, you can also mitigate this with the uh, research as done by MIDI. <laughs> so, so nevertheless, one uh, one of the topic they mentioned is the something we can do to to make hardware more secure is uh, they call it a uh, uh, trusted the, uh, execution environment. Yeah, exactly. So. And, uh, and this trusted execution environment, they are they are well known how to it's well known how to make them and use them for 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 usual hardware like uh, CPUs that uh, we use uh, all the time. But uh, machine learning uses more and more specialized hardware, and we can expect that in the future uh, there will be new specialized hardware designed for specifically for machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence systems. And the problem is that uh, creating this secure environment. Uh, incur a cost, and uh, and what they think will happen is that this cost is uh, as we update the software we use, this cost will be, need to be uh, paid every time to to create secure environment on this new type of software. So, yeah, the the, the authors recommend that uh, we should work towards uh, building this kind of secure environment on the hardware, but uh, but. But they realize that it's also a, a costly, uh, costly thing to do, specifically for AI, which uh, updates its hardware often. Yeah. Yeah. So they, 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 
Well, like one of the people who at our discussion uh, shared uh, a couple of papers that show that, uh, that there is an ongoing research in uh, designing, uh, in particular, GPU, uh, so graphical uh, uh, process, processing units uh, that are used to parallelize the computation in, uh, in uh, uh, neural networks uh, learning. Uh, this uh, is being, uh, well, this is research into making this more uh, uh, into a trusted execution environment. Yeah, uh, another thing that was discussed in, in this section was uh, uh, providing academics with more hardware. Uh, so typically uh, to test, but the idea is like to test uh, the YouTube algorithm, for instance, or other big things like this. Uh, you, you're going to need to test through a lot of angles and this requires a lot of computational power. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, like if you want to just keep up with the, the latest developments in AI, like uh, these days, uh, the, the big papers, uh, uh, things by OpenAI, for instance, uh, represent, uh, uh, I don't know, was it thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars? <laughs> On this, on this, there's maybe a connection to be made with, uh, so recently there's, uh, there are calls for reproducible research in NL and, and uh, we see in the submission platforms of uh, NeurIPS and ICML, which is the two ma are the two major venues for machine learning, uh, that um, you have no incentives to, to explain how, how reproducible is, is, is your results and uh, your code, etc. And you have to provide uh, some helpful um, uh, some helpful information for uh, for people who would like to reproduce your work. Uh, two years ago, one year ago, uh, an effort led by uh, Joel Pinot on reproducibility was to take uh, to take codes or papers, code and etc. from these papers and and use it as students as students projects where they would verify the reproducibility of of the work. Uh, and within this discussion, so many people, um, a member suggested that. Uh, so, like, I remember, like, I ever like when, when Joy Pino was giving giving this talk uh, on reproducibility at EPFL, I, I asked her, "Why want you? So, if you want to have some built-in reproducibility um, uh, guide uh, ch ch checkpoints uh, in in in, uh, in the submission." For, 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 and also for the reviewers to, to, to check the reproducibility, why not provide computing power to 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 academics who would like to, to verify the reproducibility, especially that like we have some papers, of course, this is not yet the, the most this is not yet the, the average paper, but some some exceptions. Uh, recently there was a paper from I think DeepMind and uh, Ben Rest was uh, ranting and explaining that to to verify these experiments you need one million power of uh, one million dollars of, uh, of GP yeah. and uh, so, so you can't expect academics to verify claims or, 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 or results uh, so one thing you can imagine is that uh, you could impose or incentivize companies to provide computing power for academics when reviewing their code yeah, or when reviewing the work, but again, I I don't know what's the cost benefit for this. This could be an idea. Yeah, uh, yeah, but it, it's yeah, it, it is like it's not clear. Well, probably you're going to need some legal thing. Like a, I think be the legal and the financial parts. There is also the career incentive part. Yeah, I don't see any academic incentivized. By their employer to spend their time verifying the reproducibility. Oh, yeah, of yeah, yeah. this is like. Uh, <laughs> we are not even incentivized to verify the reproducibility of other academics' work. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't see a world where we would be incentivized to, re to, to verify the reproducibility sometimes, of companies' work. Sometimes not even of our own work. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I think yeah, there is a. I think beyond the financial and legal part, I think the the real bottleneck is academic incentives and career incentives. That that, that would block any hope for this uh, this path. Yeah, yeah. Th th there's like this reproducibility concern, but I guess there's also a competitiveness uh, concern and also a, a concern for the ability to uh, to to 
to audit uh, large-scale systems. Uh, um, yeah, and, and just to get this computing power, like, well, it's going to be costly at some point, and uh, yeah. But yeah, it will be like a lot more costly than uh, because, like, uh, like in computer science, like uh, most of the the cost of an academic is, uh, I'm guessing, still like uh, wages. Like, and as opposed to some other fields where, like in biology, they have these very uh, expensive equipment. Like compared to this, I don't know how computing power would compare to to a new MRI machine or, <laughs> or stuff like this. Oh, I don't know. I think it's it's about equal. Uh, I know some uh, some colleagues at uh, EPFL who spend about the same number of uh, of uh, CHF. Uh, in computing power as the other server. Okay. And for I, I expect that for people working with an even bigger system, then the the price of the salary doesn't matter compared to the price of the hardware they use. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to talk about uh, specifications? Yeah. Uh, so uh, auditing auditors also. Yeah, we can talk about, well, so yeah, now I guess we're going to talk about things that are a bit beyond the scope of the paper. Um, so one thing we discussed is the problem of auditing auditors. And I, I think it's a neglected uh, challenge uh, because it's, I don't think it's really easy at all like to, to, to understand like if uh, uh, what well, auditors are doing what they're supposed to do, but also if they, uh, they are actually auditing the things that they should be auditing. <laughs> uh, so, so well, when we're talking about trust, there are two issues. Like one is like, uh, is the, the the person willing to do what we would want him to be doing? And the other question is, is he competent enough to do the things that we want him to be doing? And I think both should be uh, uh, yeah evaluated at, at some point. Um, and yeah, so to, to understand uh, if auditors are doing uh, the, the right job, like we you ask a few questions about the, the, the banking industry or the, the, the uh, restaurant, like uh, health uh, uh, healthcare industry about the, the standards of restaurants or, or hygiene in restaurants. And it's not clear that uh, auditors are doing actually uh, audit as they should be. There's this importance of having uh, a good relationship with the person you're auditing, uh, and it's actually like uh, instrumental to do good auditing. Like the, you, you want to create this this trust between the auditors and the auditee, and uh, because of this, then you have a lot of sorts of human changes, I guess. Uh, and and in the case of uh, of algorithms, uh, an additional problem is that you you can actually wonder if the what the auditors are, are, are searching for is actually what's most uh, relevant. Uh, for instance, to take a very concrete example uh, for contact tracing, uh, there's a lot of very diverging opinions. And uh, for instance, what uh, WTO is uh, is kind of recommending, uh, is recommending, uh, is not necessarily aligned with what uh, the Human Rights uh, Council is saying about this technology so uh there, there's a ten tension here uh, and it, it can be very very complex if you move to a system like uh, the youtube algorithm uh, like what should it recommend like well, well, like yeah, for instance uh or, or for linkedin for instance uh, should it recommend as many times this uh, this kind of job to to men and women even though they're in this kind of field like in for instance in programming there are you know, it turns out that there are a lot more men than women so does this mean, that, well, yeah, just there's this tension in fairness well known between individual fairness and group fairness. Uh, yeah, it's not that easy to know what should be done. And this, I guess, leads me to the other point, which is the point of specifying what it is that we want for these algorithms. And uh, I, I fear it may be neglected by, uh, well, at least for the, the paper does not talk about this. So I will, and, uh, like I can understand that it has had other priorities, but I feel personally that uh, specification is a huge part, like is a critical part of building trustworthy algorithms. Uh, like if you want to have a collaborator 
or so for, for a given project, you, you want to, like, if you want to trust him, like, you want to make sure that his incentives are somewhat aligned with what you want to do. Uh, I think it, it's part of, uh, of trustworthiness. And uh, if he has hidden motives, uh, then uh, it's not going to be good for you. Then, so uh, the, the answer to this is that uh, so that you you trust your 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 uh, your collaborator, and uh, so instead of giving her or him, uh, so yeah, uh, instead of giving her on him like the mindset of your company or the spirit of your intentions, you start giving them more and more detailed uh, to-do lists of tasks. And eventually, this becomes a uh, very costly to do. And uh, yeah, so yeah, you'd always look for aligned, uh, aligned collaborators, uh, uh, not for uh, collaborators uh, for which you would spend time. For each of you, actually, you, you, and him or her, spending a lot of time just specifying tasks and exact intentions. Yeah, yeah. I, like I feel like the 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 people may have started with the assumption that uh, the specifications are, are unknown or like not too hard to specify or and then it's mostly a matter of auditing and verifying that they are satisfied but uh like specifications are, ex are a huge mess like if you think about uh, concrete problems like uh even like contact tracing but uh, especially if you move to to recommend the systems just specifying what it is that we want these things to be doing is huge and any specification is going to be extremely complex uh, just writing down the specification is probably going to be impossible like uh, uh, and even if you write it down if you write an algorithm probably there's going to be a specification gaming uh, there's a recent uh, DeepMind uh, uh, paper about this uh, so it's also called the reward hacking so if you're your your specifications are somewhat what you want, but not exactly what you want. Uh, then uh, the RDT can fully satisfy all of them, all of your specifications, and turn out to do something that it is not what you want it to be doing. So I feel like uh, uh, thinking about specification in general is uh, is neglected. Okay. Okay. Good for today. Yes. Cool. Thank you. And uh, so next week, what we discuss? We. So uh, thanks for listening to the podcast. Next week, uh, we will discuss the paper titled "Closing the AI Accountability Gap: Defining an End-to-End -end Framework for Internal Algorithmic Auditing." Because today we talked a lot about auditing, but uh, it's still un unclear what uh, what auditing actually means and. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why we are, I'm looking forward to this interesting discussion on uh, how to better audit algorithms and maybe do it with the right specifications. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.